headquarters. Come out the gun. Stand by this tavern battery. One broadside into it, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Blind stops ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire. Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's indomitable man of the sea, Horatio Hornblower. I'd been obliged to turn over the Natividad to the madman Don Julian, who called himself Divine, Almighty, El Supremo. Now he was coming aboard to murder my prisoners, the Spanish officers. I was determined to save them, at least. Come here, you. Are you the Spanish sailing master? Si, si, no. Uh, what is that image beside the path rail there? It, 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 it. It's of the Virgin and Child, you know. Throw it overboard. But wait, Tino. I prefer to have the pleasure myself. So, now, which is the youngest of your mates? I am, Senor. Very well. You will hold up your hand and declare your disbelief in any other divine lord than our gracious El Supremo. Up with your hand. Good. Now repeat after me. I swear. I. I swear. Oh, no. No, Senor. No, I cannot. I dare not. No. Then we shall not meet you, shall we? Lieutenant oh, Mario, there now. Throw that overboard. No, the next man. You swear your disbelief. There was no further trouble from the officers. They took the new oath one by one, as indeed they were. Oh, you see, men. Then De Crespo spoke to the crew. A mixed collection of Spaniards, Chinese, Negroes, Indians. Sweeping Spaniards from the Dominion of America. Within a year, the whole of the land from Mexico to Peru will be at his feet. There will be an end of Spanish misrule, of brutal domination, of slavery in mine and thieves. There will be land for everybody. Freedom and happiness under El Supremo. You can join us all. The alternative you have seen. Now, who is for El Supremo? I am. I am too. Thank you too, Captain. I think there is no more need for your prize crew now. Should any insubordination arise later, I shall be able to deal with it. I'm quite sure you will. Mr. Gerard, you will order your crew to withdraw and return to the Lydia. 
As my boat bore me back to my ship, I reflected bitterly on the murder of the Spanish master's mate. But there was nothing I could have done. At all costs, I must not fall out with Supremo or his followers while my orders remained uncompleted. As I reached my own deck, the boom of a gun from the Natividad was answered by one from the Lydia. A new flag was flying from the peak of the Natividad, blue with a yellow star in the middle. Fire six! If I hadn't been born a ruddy fool, I shouldn't be here. <laughs> Fire seven! I've left my wife and I left my home everything that's dear. <laughs> Half an hour later, El Supremo came riding down to the beach with his ragged retinue, and I met him there. As we rode out to the Lydia, I ran my eye over the ship to see that all was ready to receive our ally with full military formality. But before he mounted the ladder, he remarked, The correct salute for me, Captain, is 23 guns. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Bush, uh, pass the word to Mr. Marsh for 23 guns. <clears throat> Don't look so stricken, Mr. Bush. It's two more than his majesty himself receives. It's entirely meaningless. Ah, I sir. Dinner will be served shortly, El Supremo. Would you care to come below? I will dine here, alone. Let the food be brought to me. The misery and embarrassment of our makeshift dinner in the gun room, into which we crowded with Supremo's retinue, was mercifully cut short by the arrival of the officer of the watch. Uh, beg pardon, sir, but there's a messenger from the shore. I, I can't understand a word he says. Oh, very well, I'll come on deck. Um, I think you'd better accompany me, Mr. Bush. Uh, thank you, sir. Last uh, load, thank heaven. Never seen such a damn little murderous gang of cats out in my life. Soldiers, they call them. I give a week's back, he doesn't know what that captain's up to. Eh. You don't stand what he's standing from this supreme of an Well, here we are. Lay it alongside. Come on, Ansem, up that ladder. Up the ladder, I say. We aren't sitting here all day. Lord, please, as awkward as a powder monkey. Look out, he's lost his old stand from under. Perishing fine time to go swimming, is it? Supremo, but uh, <clears throat> may I not have the honor of 
following the lesson you have so kindly taught me. I do not understand you, Captain. Allow me to demonstrate. Um, uh, Harvey, come here. I'm here, sir. You have displeased El Supremo, Harvey, which means uh, <coughs> death. I give you permission to go. P permission to... Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you kindly, sir. of Supremo was so colossal that it apparently never occurred to him that Harvey was probably the finest diver and swimmer in the British Navy. Yes. 
then I will bid you goodbye for the time being. If I reach Panama first, I will arrange your welcome. Thank you, sir. You see, Mr. Bush, the situation is complicated. It's not your fault, sir. After all, you have only obeyed your admiralty orders. The Lords of the Admiralty will not allow such a small point to influence their opinion of a captain and his officers, who are the cause of such trouble, Mr. Bush. Ah, I feel you're right, sir. However, there's another and more pressing matter. Lady Barbara Wellesley is at Panama and desires a passage in the Lydia to Europe. But, sir, how could we carry such a lady in the Lydia? Ah. The frigate is hardly equipped for comfort. That is what I shall have to point out to the lady. Now, if she has the normal Wellesley blood in her, I suspect I shall be wasting my time. I was soon to have an opportunity of finding out at first hand. We sailed into the roadstead of Panama the next morning. There's a lady about, sir. An English lady, I think. Wants to go aboard, sir. Uh, <clears throat> she seems disinclined to wait for permission, it seems. We shall uh, take no action, Mr. Bush. Mm-hmm. One of those masculine women. No real woman would catch and climb a rope ladder like that. Besides, what's an English woman doing in Panama without a male escort? Mr. Midshipman, please be so good as to have my luggage brought up out of the boat. Oh, well, well the, there's the captain, madam. Yes, so I see. But please have my luggage brought up while I speak to him. I faced an internal struggle. I disliked the aristocracy. I could not forget that as a doctor's son, I had had to touch my hat to the local squire. Yet it would be foolish for a poverty-stricken frigate captain with no influence to offend a member of such a family as the Wellesley's. For the present, I decided on icy formality. Are you the captain of this ship, sir? Captain Hornblower, at your service, ma'am. Well, I am Lady Barbara Wellesley. I wrote you a note requesting a passage to England. I trust you received it? I did, ma'am, but uh, I do not think it wise for your ladyship to join this vessel. Please tell me why, sir. Because, ma'am, we shall shortly be in action with the enemy. Also, we shall have to return to England via Cape Horn. Your ladyship uh, would be well advised to make your way to Porto Bello. From there, you could reach Jamaica and obtain a berth in a West India packet, which is accustomed to female passengers. I have informed you, sir, that there is yellow fever in Porto Bello. Yes, ma'am, but... A thousand persons died of it last week. That is why I removed to Panama. May I ask why your ladyship was in Portobello? Because, sir, the West Indian packet in which I was a female passenger was captured by a Spanish privateer and brought there. I see. I regret, sir, that I cannot tell you the name of my grandmother's cook, but I shall be glad to answer any further questions which a gentleman of breeding would ask. Yes, but, but we are going out to fight, to fight a ship of twice our force. It will be dangerous. <laughs> I would rather be on your ship, whomever you have to fight, than to be in Panama with a yellow fever. Uh-huh. Oh. What of Cape Horn, ma'am? Well, I have no knowledge of it. But I've twice rounded the Cape of Good Hope during my brother's governor generalship, and I have never yet been seasick. Uh, <clears throat> well, soon, Captain, I will come to think that I shall be unwelcome aboard. I can hardly imagine that a gentleman holding the King's commission would be discourteous to a woman, especially to a woman with my name. I uh, was only doing my duty, ma'am, in pointing out the dangers to which you will be exposed for myself. Uh, nothing would... Give me <clears throat> greater pleasure than your presence. Surrender again. First to El Supremo and now to Lady Barbara. If I offended this lady, I might... Well, never command a ship again. My wife and I might rot on half pay for the rest of our lives. I was 37 and not more than one-eighth of the way up the captain's list. The goodwill of the Wellingsleys might enable me to reach flag rank. Beg your pardon, ma'am. Put your luggage into the board. Uh, thank you. Be so kind as to give this to the boat. But, ma'am, uh, there will be no room in your cabin for a tenth of that luggage. I am aware of that, sir. I have dwelt in a cabin before. That sea chest will hold all I require. The rest can be put where you will. And now, may I see my cabin? Well, you see, your ladyship, a frigate has few of the luxuries of an Indiaman. I was just thinking that it was scandalous that a king's officer should be given such quarters. And as I left to pay my call on the Viceroy... Where shall I serve her ladyship's dinner, sir? I don't know, Bush. Ask her, blast you.
show Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers.